In many ways, Douglas had gone from being a copper company town to a homeland security and insecurity company town. And there's been really great scholarship and reporting in recent years about what you might call a border security industrial complex. And it usually focuses on for-profit detention centers and big corporations profiting off of uh, prevention through deterrence, right? The Amazons and the Boeings that are producing border security technology. Um, that's really important work. But when we talk about this process, we also need to be attuned to the city budgets that depend on homeland security grants, not just on the border, but in places like Yakima, Washington, where I live, and where uh, ICE conducts uh, its deportation flights from the Pacific Northwest. Um, from the small businesses, the tire shops, and the, the used car lots, and the restaurants that depend on border security and insecurity spending. Um, and especially the Douglas High School graduate who looks around her town and thinks that Border Patrol is one of the only good jobs left available to her, and certainly one of the only jobs left to her that seems like it has a sense of purpose and a mission. So we should focus on corporations and greed, um, but we also need to talk about a whole diverse way of life that is taking form that depends on and gives people a stake in permanent border crisis. A whole range of pe people and communities, um, political movements have been taking form that depend on maintaining the appearance of permanent border crisis. So, in January of 2014, uh, I went to those two towns, Douglas and Agua Prieta, that had been at the center of this storm um, for years to see what I could learn. Um, and I wanted to, at first I wanted to explore what I saw was a fundamental tension, which is that on one hand, again, there's this beauty and richness and creativity uh, to life in the borderlands that gets so often missed in the news. Um, you know, the community of Douglas and Agua Prieta is a place where life for decades has been lived across borders where family and commerce and is always cult crossing culture and language and borders um, where people blur the border every single day. Um, you know, one of the stories a lot of people told me, uh, a lot of baby boomers told me this story, nostalgic baby boomers, so maybe we should take it with a grain of salt. Um, but I heard the story a lot about um, days when people would play baseball and home plate would be in the United States and the outfield would be in Mexico. Right? And even if that story is not true, it fully captures a spirit that was very real. And we can't romanticize the pre-1990s border at all, right? It was also a place of dispossession, of exclusion, of mistreatment, of racist violence. Um, even at its safest, it was dangerous for the most vulnerable. Uh, but in a real way, people in communities in Douglas and like Douglas and Agua Prieta modeled and are trying to continue modeling better ways of living life across borders and divides. And I think we would do well to remember that and think about that in this moment. So I went to explore that contradiction. Um, and early in the process uh, of my research, I met a, a woman named Rosie Mendoza, um, who became one of my uh, main guides to the community. I, this is going to be weird, but has anyone met Rosie Mendoza? I ask this everywhere I go because her like reach has gone like around the country. <laughs> it's always impressive how, where I am and people know her. Um, she is a badass, formerly undocumented social worker who works with um, people uh, who have survived domestic and sexual violence in the borderlands. Um, and she figures heavily in this book. Um, she became one of my main guides. She encouraged Aida to get in contact with me uh, and to tell her story. Um, it actually took a while for us to meet. Um, and there's a funny little story in the book that you can read about how we finally did meet. Um, but suffice it to say that um, on a wintry day um, in 2014, uh, Ida and I met at the 10th Street Park. And we sat by the fountain. And she told me her story. And I had not planned at all to write a book about one person. 
and much less to place violence against women at the heart of a border book. Um, but I knew almost immediately after that conversation that Ida had a powerful message for everyone who looks at the border and immigration from a more privileged position. Um, and that our whole approach to border security cannot be understood apart from the ways it makes women's lives less secure and more exposed to violence. And Ida's story left me shaking on that day in 2014. Uh, it still does. For, if some of you have read the book and you know it's filled with such intense pain and suffering. But the thing that left me in tears that day was the fierce pride that she had when she told the story. Um, she had this kind of brio and wit and humor and a kind of audacious pride um, that came from having survived time and time again by the seat of her pants, by her wits alone, from having fought against enormous odds for a place for herself and her son in this country. And amid all that suffering was a message that the sheer act of surviving the world we have made on the U.S.-Mexico border is itself a form of dignity and worth and value as valuable as any uh, affluent person's accomplishments. That hit me. And as the great writer Hector Tobar writes, um, that spirit gets missed in a lot of reporting on immigration today, where uh, uh, immigrants are, are sometimes portrayed as passive victim props for tragic immigration tales. Um, but I wanted to, to convey instead that spirit, spirit of audacity and wit and pride. Um, and there's actually tremendous pressure when writing about immigration for a commercial uh, audience uh, to reinforce, Amer to tell stories that reinforce American mythologies. Mm -hmm. Nation of Immigrants, um, The Ark of Progress. Um, the, nav the, the novelist Madeline Fitch um, talks about the selling allure of what she calls neoliberal realism. Stories in which uh, deserving poor people um, endure incredible violence and hardship in order to triumph in the end thus reassuring mostly at white affluent readers that the United States is indeed a great and good place and that individual work does pay off and progress does reign in the end. And I was kind of half aware of this at the time and only really began to understand it later, but Ida was guiding us towards a different kind of immigrant story. Um, and it's not one with a guaranteed happy ending, but it's still filled with power and empowerment um, and inspiration. But that empowerment doesn't come from, you know, the plucky, hardworking hero achieving and then redeeming the American dream. Um, instead, it comes from the choice to struggle in, on in the face of the structural denial of that dream. And emergent in that, um, I also felt that there was a different conception of American belonging, a different way of thinking about membership. Um, as many of you know, it's, it's difficult to overstate how much of our immigration debates and even our sense of the United States as a nation of immigrants turns on what I see as an impossible binary between on one hand the kind of flawless, perfect, innocent, high achieving, good immigrant and on the other hand um, the, the bad criminal immigrant who des one deserves perhaps sympathy and rights and the other deserves all the punishment she gets. Um, and I know that maybe it, it doesn't seem like this is so much the case today because it feels like Trump has uh, declared war on all immigrants all the time. Um, but I, I think it still does. And I live in, a, I live in rural eastern Washington. I live in a county that went almost 20 points for Trump. Um, and I meet Republicans every day um, who are outraged by the treatment of you know, innocent children on the border, 
they're upset by the, the failure to protect high-achieving dreamers even, um, but they are perfectly happy to sentence those children's supposedly criminal parents to the worst punishments uh, and death. Um, and in part as a result of this kind of impossible binary, as many of you really know, um, we've created an immigration system with very little room for mistakes. Um, Rossi Mendoza often says, humans make mistakes, immigrants can't. But on that first wintry day, when she told her story, Ida was not soliciting my pity. She wasn't disavowing her past mistakes. Uh, her story just blazed with and, pride and sufficiency. Um, and this, I think, was pointing to a vision of belonging that rejects that impossible good, bad immigrant binary of American deservingness um, an alt and provides an alternative vision founded on the recognition that, mo that, that people whose complicated lives don't fit into that good, bad binary, which is to say, most people, right, um, are deeply parts of their communities, are members and active makers of their communities, regardless of past mistakes and human flaws, and that we need to have an immigration system um, founded on that recognition. Now, of course, the idea of having someone write a book about you uh, would not click with most people. Um, but it did for Ida, um, and we talked about this for, for several months. Um, I wavered through much of it, um, but she was clear through the whole process. Um, she knew where she stood, and that was that telling her story could be part of her healing process, and that um, it was telling her story was a way to take all of that suffering she had been through and to turn it into something um, that could have an impact or make a difference. Erin, I've been through death already, she, would, she often said. At least telling my story can turn that into something that can reach people and make a difference. From there, the hard work of research began um, because getting a story this sensitive and difficult uh, right. Um, it meant doing many, many hours of interviews with Ida, um, with her family, with her friends, with people whose lives intersected with hers. Um, it meant cross-checking those stories with hundreds of pages of medical and police and immigration and school records and other kinds of records, uh, listening to court recordings, talking with uh, physicians and psychologists and immigration attorneys and others to verify the plausibility of the stories I was hearing. Um, I did more than 100 interviews with uh, city officials and law enforcement and business and other folks in Douglas and Agua Prieta to provide context. Um, it also meant carefully going over drafts of the book with Ida and having Ida shape the, the narrative. It meant getting drafts of the book to her family members, to other people who appear in the book, and getting crucial feedback from them along the way. You know, it's apparent that I'm a, a middle-aged, white male, over-educated, and fairly affluent, and Ida is, um, is not. Um, and so there is a lot of risk of, of missing things, of misrepresenting things, of, of causing problem. Early in the, the project, I, I printed out and taped over my computer a quote from the anthropologist uh, Philippe Bourgois, um, who is uh, paraphrasing another anthropologist, Laura Nader, and the quote went something like, don't write about the poor and impressed because everything you say can and will be used against them. Um, and to try to mitigate that, it was about collaborating with Ida and having her share uh, and shape the narrative, but it was also about uh, engaging with activists and scholars of color, particularly women, um, not just engaging with their work, um, but also a commitment to getting the draft out um, to activists and scholars of color and women uh, who could understand the benefits of a project like this, but also its risks. Um, in a really immediate way. And my conversations with um, folks uh, usually began with their, were the question, you know, should I publish this? 
Um, and it was out of conversations and the feedback I got through that process um, that it felt like we could move forward. Um, I also did things to get details right um, that I never would have expected myself to be doing. Um, it's a spoiler, but at, the, at this, this point in the book, Ida is living in New York City and I'm in Washington, and so we're each on our phones and we're, we're texting back and forth and we're looking at Google Maps together, a Google Map, or Google, sorry, Google Street View of Douglas, Arizona, and we're like, wait, is that the tree you're talking about? Is that the, or wait, is that the wall you were talking about where you were like seven and like going through through stories like that, um, through the same like long distance high tech uh, relation, uh, we looked at Chola makeup videos together, <laughs> uh, so I could get that. Um, I think maybe I got that. Um, and over time, the story and the research expanded uh, to include lots of other people um, whose lives intersected with Ida's. There's Rossi, who I mentioned. There's Alvaro, uh, who's a self-described Chicano death metal, death metal bassist and addict, um, who says that he can calm other people but not himself. Um, there's Katie, a Mexican-American asylum seeker who's the guardian of her two siblings who are minors and have been separated from her at the border. There's Emma, an Ecuadorian uh, LGBTQ activist um, who's seeking asylum in the United States, whose life intersects with Ida's in a really important way. And then there's also Raul, um, who is a complicated hero of Mexico's 1960s guerrilla movement. Um, whose life also plays a key role in Ida's. But all through that, it remains Ida's story, grounded in her memories, um, s told by me, and surrounded by much additional research. Um, and two years into the work, um, I broached the idea of money with Ida. Um, and after a lot of back and forth and discussion, we decided to split the proceeds of the book um, in three ways. Um, a third for her, um, a third to support the Chiricahua Community Health Center's uh, work in Douglas with people um, surviving sexual and domestic violence in the borderlands, and a third to me to cover the costs of the research and the fact checker and um, the various aspects uh, that, that goes into this kind of project. And in the course of this, I made three commitments to Ida. One, that she could stop the project at any time and just leave and finish it. And I encouraged her to talk with her family and therapists about whether it was the right thing to do, um, and she did that. Um, second, that she would uh, read drafts throughout the process. Um, and that we'd make this as collaborative a process as possible. And if she ever revealed anything in an interview that in retrospect she thought was too personal, um, we, she could tell me and I would just take it out. Um, and those two commitments um, are very much not the norm within journalism. Um, but from the world of eth eth ethnography, um, where I'm coming out of, um, they, were a, they were a more kind of standard um, kind of practice. And then the third commitment was that I would do my best to portray her, um, not as a demon or as a saint, um, but as a real complex, flawed human person, and that her story would matter in itself not just as an illustration for political points or political uh, arguments about the border. Um, and this commitment was crucial for me especially um, because if I'm honest, I did go to Douglas searching for stories to illustrate political arguments about immigration and the border. Um, but the process of sinking myself into the years of research with Ida, doing the research, and then sinking myself into writing this really difficult emotional story um, made me realize that the immediate political critiques are in the book, and that's good. Um, but that the power of a narrative bearing faithful witness to Ida's story goes far beyond that. So since we've been talking about narratives, I just want to read a very short little piece um, of the book. Um, I chose this because it's quite short. Um, it gives you a little taste of the, of the, of the book. Um, and I also think this is a really important 
piece of the book because so there's been an incredible amount of reporting on the horrific conditions in immigration detention recently. Yes? Um, it, that's quite impressive that that has come about. Um, when I was writing this book, um, even just, you know, a year and a half ago, um, and I was writing the parts about horrific conditions in immigration detention, I was being really careful to try to verify and back up everything because I didn't think people would believe it. You know, this, it was such extreme stuff that it's like, oh, no one will believe that. Now I feel like thanks to a lot of that reporting, people do believe it. But one of the things I've noticed about a lot of the reporting about immigration detention is that it often treats uh, people in detention as passive victims of the system. Um, and I, I love this little passage because it just, it gives a, a very different um, vision of, of life in detention um, that gives a kind of different picture. Inside the courtroom, Ida felt meek and intimidated. Over the course of seven preliminary hearings, she had not said much more than, yes, Your Honor, and thank you, Your Honor. Outside, though, Ida had come into her own. She still helped her podmates translate immigration documents for free, and a number of them had begun to trust her judgment. For many of them, she was the closest thing to an immigration attorney they had. Emma, of course, loved the way the curly-haired Mexicana stuck out her, sucked in her cheeks and stuck out her jaw in response to every new outrage from the Corrections Corporation of America. And when prison officials cut the women's meager shampoo and toilet paper ration in half, Ida truly became a leader. This is not okay, Katie. We can't let them get away with this. Katie hesitated, reluctant to get involved. But Ida was right. ICE and CCA wanted prisoners to purchase high-priced toiletries from the commissary. Many women in the pod simply couldn't spend several dollars worth of commissary credit for hotel-sized shampoo. Some had no credit at all. Think about her, Ida said, pointing to a Mayan indigenous woman from Guatemala with barely 18 with no outside support. Even those prisoners with access to commissary credit pinched pennies. Family members on the outside worked hard for that money, and Western Union claimed steep fees on transfers to prisoners' accounts. Like Ida, most women in the pod saved commissary credit for phone calls, tampons, and edible food. Ramen noodles, peanut butter, and cookies provided crucial supplements to the cafeteria's pasty rounds of pan, pasta, y papas. In the end, Katie looked on while Ida wrote a letter of protest and circulated through the pod collecting signatures. About a dozen women refused to sign, fearing retaliation, but Ida persuaded most of the pod to join. The letter provoked quick action. A two-man team of ICE officers responded to the complaint, slapping Ida's letter down on the, one of the pod's steel tables. What's going on here? Outraged women erupted in Spanish opprobrium all at once, and the agents visibly tensed. Then Ida's voice cut through the noise, explaining in English the hardships the reductions caused. Yeah, but we implemented this in the mail section with no problems, one of the officers countered. Why is it the mail section uses so much less toilet paper than you women? The retort slipped out before Ida could think. Because you shake and we wipe. <laughs> One official couldn't stifle a laugh at this, but his partner plowed forward. What about shampoo? Why do you use so much more than the men? Ida said nothing this time. Instead, not breaking eye contact, she removed a hair tie and shook out her long curls. The other women followed suit, waving their thick manes like protest flags. Thank you. So, I'm open to questions. We don't have a, how long do we go here today? Someone? We usually go until 1.30, but maybe we can okay. stand quite close to okay. So always has to be someone to do, jump in first. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Borders. A believer in reporters? In free borders. Oh, free borders. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, uh, I'm not. What, what do you mean by free borders? Well, there is a movement, Alex Rivera, ah, for yeah. example, the director that is coming mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. that borders should be free. There yeah. should be no um, any kind of regulation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, utopian kind of thing. Right. But uh, not as uh, unjustifiable as it seems at the first time. Yeah. Well, so, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you go, like, right to the heart of it all. <laughs> um, uh, so... You know, I, I do think that as long as the, the world is structured around nation states, and that's not inevitable, um, uh, it, you know, in the long, long run of history, um, there will be borders between those nation states, but that doesn't mean that the current arrangement of bordering that we have now is inevitable or natural. Um, and in fact, the kind of regime of really restrictive immigration uh, borders, uh, or borders that restrict flows of people, is a relatively new concept. Um, uh, you know, 19th century, late 19th century. Um, so yeah, I do, th I, I do think that we need to move to a much more what, what critics would call an open border um, policy, um, which is to say that um, open, it, by that I mean bringing migration back into the realm of visas and verification and inspection and ports of entries, right? Because right now, our supposed closed border policies, what that has done is it's pushed migration out into, it hasn't stopped migration, it's pushed migration out into the uncontrolled deserts and dangerous mountains, uh, into the hands of, of violent cartels, um, and uh, that's disordered and chaotic and insecure. Um, and so this is the kind of argument I have with people who kind of hear open borders and get very afraid um, is that like in fact it's a much more secure uh, way to have a border is to bring uh, migration back into the realm of visas and inspections and ports of entry and that means an immigration system that um, has abundant visas for people who are coming to work or rejoin families um, an immigration system that um, really ref reflects the long imperial projection of the United States into Latin America in particular. Um, and, you know, as Central American migrant activists today talk about, like, we're here because you were there. <laughs> And you can't understand, uh, you know, right now we don't have a border crisis so much as we have a crisis in Central America um, that we are then making much worse on the border. Um, but, and the reason there's a Central America crisis, you can't understand that without understanding, uh, you know, a century and a half of, of banana company coups and Cold War um, campaigns and so-called war on drugs. Um, so uh, I think our immigration system needs to uh, account for the long intertwined of, of, of Latin America and the United States and, and reflect that in the number of visas that are available. Yeah. You spoke about uh, just a little bit or you mentioned the Maculadora. <coughs> what kind of, um, what kind of uh, lifestyle pe do people live that work in those shops? Is it better than the, the average person uh, in Tijuana? Yeah, so you're talking about the kind of the global assembly factories, uh, often quite high tech um, in Mexico. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a few years since I've done kind of careful looking at, at that situation, but the last time I was really looking at it carefully, um, you know, folks in, I, I would always put the puzzle to my students, which is that folks in Maquiladoras um, in Mexico are making more than folks in other parts of the Mexican economy. Um, and the conditions are often better than you would expect, you know, kind of with the stereotype of sweatshops, and, and certainly there are horrible, abusive maquilas as well, but, um, and that it's still unjust, and it's still not a good path of development for Mexico. Um, so it kind of, there's a contradiction there, right, where um, productivity has soared in those maquiladoras, um, and real wages have stayed the same or gone down. Um, and so someone is making a lot of money off of the fact that, that wages in the maquiladoras are not, um, are not tracking with, with productivity. But again, this is something that's a, it's been a while since I've really looked at this carefully. Yeah? Um, 
of people who've read your book that um, have changed their mind about their opinion about the border or immigration or any any thoughtful commentary you've received? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I've received a, a lot of emails since the book came out from folks. Um, and, uh, you know, one type of email that I've gotten quite a few of is people who are like social workers or immigrant rights activists of various kinds who, who read the book and felt like that it kind of inspired them to keep doing what they're doing. Um, and so, I mean, maybe not changing their minds, but really kind of providing fuel. Um, I think certainly it's changed a lot of people's understanding of the border um, and trying to, to rethink the way the border 